Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. In this presentation, I want to talk about some of my research on baseball batting, and I want to kind of accomplish two things. First, I want to outline some of the key differences between the two skill acquisition approaches. Um, also, you know, these are approaches to motor control, um, the information processing approach, and the ecological approach, right? And so I'm going to highlight some of the key differences that I see. And then I'm going to talk about more specifically about visual motor control and baseball batting and kind of illustrate how we can take these differences and they lead to different understandings of this behavior and talk about how we can understand batting in terms of both these kind of approaches in terms of predictive model-based control or perspective online control. So we're going to look at both of those. So this uh, difference between the two approaches is something that I uh, presented on in the video that you can find on my YouTube channel if you're interested. I go into a whole array of the differences and how the kind of starts with a, the nature of perception and kind of goes upwards from there in, in terms of and leads to uh, implications for how we train and what technologies are going to work and things like that. So if you're interested in hearing the whole thing, you can find it at that this site, perceptionaction.com slash resources and a bunch of other things there. Throughout the presentation today, I'm going to uh, refer to some of my stuff on my website just for more information, if you're interested in more information. But let's start with this difference, right? So what are the differences between the two ways that we can think about motor control and, and skill acquisition? So it all starts with the nature of perception, how we believe perception works. And in the information processing approach, which I'm going to call IP, the key assumption is that the information we get from the environment is insufficient, right? It's lacking, it's impoverished, it's the retinal image that's blurry upside down, um, it's ambiguous, right? So we talk about cues instead of information, right? So I need to elaborate on the stuff that's coming in through my senses, right? I need to add stuff like from memory, I need to add expectancies, anticipation. Um, and this is an example over here is an example of an information processing model, a uh, very well-known one, uh, Gary Klein's uh, recognition prime decision-making model. You can see all these steps that we do to process the information in an, an internal mental representation. Right? We're, we're, we're taking the information, we need to enhance it in some ways. This is why when we teach traditionally, we teach the course, we call it sensation and perception, right? Those are different things. Sensation is the, the stuff coming in. Perception is our interpretation of it, right? We have to disambiguate it. We have to add to it because it's lacking. That's kind of the key root assumption of the information processing approach. And from this is going to, uh, uh, everything we know about skill all the way up to baseball batting as I'll show you later on. Um, the assumption in the ecological approach, which I'll call E, is the complete opposite. The, the assumption in the ecological approach is the information is not impoverished. It's actually completely sufficient on its own for guiding our actions, right? So instead of cues, right, things that might suggest what's out there, like clues, we have specifying information that actually directly tells us what's out there. Um, interpretation, processing, enhancing with memory, uh, predicting is all completely unnecessary, right? We don't need to do that because it tells us everything we need to know, right? Um, and sensation and perception are the same thing, right? They're one and the same thing because there's not this interpretation process going on, right? So the very different direct versus indirect perception, that's where it all starts. Because of this, this influences how we think about the control of action. In the information processing approach, because the cues are insufficient, we have to predict, right? We, we have to guess about, make an educated guess about what's going to happen next so we can do something, right? We can act. So, for example, if I want to hit a baseball, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, we need to guess, make a prediction about where the ball is going to be and when it's going to be there. And we do this using an internal model that takes these impoverished information sources from the environment and adds to it. We add advanced cues from the athletes, the kinematics. We add, add situational probabilities. You know, what's the score in tennis? We pick up cues from the ball's flight and we put it all together in some combination of model, computational model, and then we make a prediction. Using this prediction, an example of this, if, if you want to see this kind of in detail, 
um, I did, there's this kind of well circulated video of uh, this where they took Ronaldo and had him uh, heading soccer balls and kicking soccer balls in the dark. And if you listen to the interpretation of the commentators in that, it's a very much this predictive control, right? So he's using advanced cues to tell where the ball is going to go. He's predicting. His subconscious is interpreting body language, calculating speed and trajectory, internal representation, doing computations, doing math in his head, right? And there's a, I did a blog post on this in case you're interested where I'm going to say that this is actually not evidence of predictive control at all. But that's the idea, right? We're going to predict what's going to happen, where a ball is going to be and when for cross soccer ball or baseball. Well, they're then going to use that to parameterize some motor program, okay? A motor program for hitting. And the program may be updated later on based on feedback or some other information, but we're going to use this program to generate an open loop ballistic movement, right? What, you know, we're predicting what's going to happen in the future, so we're going to act to get there in an open loop way. Right? Once we make this prediction, we're not going to use feed information anymore, right? We know what's going to happen in the future. Now we can act, right? So that's the basic idea of information processing, right? Information processing, we're using it to make a prediction to add to our motor program, right? So that's kind of one idea of control. Um, the author, other view is, is in the ecological approach is that the information is not used in a representation. It's not used for prediction. Instead, People are directing their attention at what's called educating their attention to the information so they can establish some information movement coupling. They can link the movement of their body to some information source to get achieve the goal they want to achieve, right? And so in soccer, right, in Ronaldo, if you, and I, again, I elaborate on this in this blog post, instead of having to predict where the ball is going to go and then go there, he can just start moving and control his movement the acceleration of his his body, Y double dot, based on the information, the ball's flight, the ball's angle of approach, essentially, and the time to contact, which is given by the ball's expansion, right? So all he has to do is move so as to keep this relationship true. That will get him to the ball to head it at the right place at the right time without ever having to make a prediction about what's going on, right? And we call this kind of control perspective control. Okay, so it's online continuous control. I'm not predicting and making open loop movement. I'm online continuously controlling, making a controlled movement. Okay, and the key idea within perspective control is I'm what I'm doing is acting using information about my current future. Right, so that information I showed you in the diagram is telling the soccer player what's going to happen if you keep doing what you're doing now. Right? If you keep doing what you're doing now, you're going to arrive at the same location as the ball at the right time right? without predicting. Okay, So these are the two fundamentally different ways we can control our actions. Predictively, using an internal model and open loop control, or prospectively, by coupling online movement to information. Okay? And from this, we get a really different view of what makes an expert. right? In the information processing view, expertise is comes from knowledge about. And this is a terminology that Gibson used. It comes from what's in your head. It comes from having a good internal mental model. It has a large knowledge base. It has a large number of situations maybe you've stored in there, a large amount of memories, a large number of if X, then Y rules, right? And a really key important point in, in what I do is if you believe this, then this this is separable from the actual motor control. We can train this thing out of context, this internal model using out of context stimuli. Whereas in the ecological approach, right, expertise is not in the person's head, not in the athlete, it's in the relationship between the athlete and their environment. It's through establishing a control law that links information from movement, right? So it's not a representation, it's not memory, it's in establishing a good uh, relationship with your environment, which can be uh, represented with a control law. It's also being well calibrated to the environment, right? Having a control law that takes into account your own capacities and abilities, right? So intelligence is not asymmetrically just in my head. It's in the relationship between the environment and the performer. Okay, so those are the kind of fundamental differences 
between the way, and for me, irreconcilable differences between how we think about skill and how we acquire skill, right? And so what I want to do for the remainder is show how I've been thinking about, and you can apply each of these two different ways of thinking about skill to the task of baseball batting, okay? Right? So approaches to baseball batting. So baseball batting, uh, this is all really kind of based on a review paper I have coming out where I've been studying baseball batting for over 20 years, I think now. It's something that's fascinated for me for a long time. And this is kind of a culmination where I've kind of actually reevaluated some of my own work and looked at a bunch of other people's work to understand which, which of those approaches I just described better explains baseball batting. Okay, So first of all, why have I been fascinated by it? Uh, because it's just an incredibly difficult task if you think about it. right? Major League Baseball, the average Major League fastball now, currently this year is 93 miles an hour, the average. The fastest pitch ever thrown and recorded in the game was by Aroldis Chapman, who's with the Yankees now, 103 miles an hour. Based on release point, that gives you a, a, a time, flight time of the ball of <laughs> a, a long one is 400 milliseconds. Right, so if you think about it, and I'm going to talk about this in a second. A baseball swing is a complex movement that involves the whole body. It's going to take at least 200, maybe 300 milliseconds to do that. So the amount of time you have to view the ball before the bat starts moving is literally the length of a blink. Right, a blink and you miss it. It's 100, about 150 milliseconds you have. The other thing, crazy thing about whoever thought of designing a game where you're trying to hit a sphere with a cylinder, right? The points of con shared contact are incredibly small. Um, and so we've calculated the kind of the temporal margin for error you have for a swing is plus or minus nine milliseconds. You have to be within to hit it into fair play. And I also say, you know, the biggest evidence I can give you of how hard baseball is, we're all, you know, a good baseball player has an on base percentage of about 40%, that may be a bit higher. They get paid $30 million for doing that, for failing 60% of the time. It must be pretty difficult, right? So, so that's a one thing I always point out. So I've been fascinated by the difficulty of this task. So let's first, before we get into the models of control, think about actually what the batter is doing, right, when they're hitting. And first of all, let's ask, what does the batter need to know, right? So the batter needs to know basically two things, where and when, right? Where's the ball going to be when it crosses the plate? When will it cross the plate, right? And I've drawn a fancy graph here that shows kind of all the angles and the geometry of a ball approaching the eye. The where is, if we just talk about height in this instance, it's this distance OP below your eyes. Um, what I want to point out here is there's, when we think about this, and again, fitting into these two approaches, we can talk about two different kinds of information. In the ecological approach and from Gibson, we have what's called specifying information, right? So specifying information is information that tells us all we need to know without further elaboration. And the easiest one to understand is this bottom one, the time to contact. So the time to contact of an approaching ball is given by its, its angular size divided by the rate of expansion of its angular size. If you've studied perception at all and you've studied um, motor, that's the famous tau. Uh, first discussed by Dave Lee. And this cue, this information source directly tells you how much time you have left. You do not need to interpret it at all. You don't even need to know what the object is or how far away it is or how fast it's moving. All you need to do is take this size information and it will tell you when the ball is going to hit you, right? So these sources of information tell the batter exactly where and when the, to get the bat to right, where to get the bat to and when to get it there, right there. So they're specifying. They tell them the information they need to know to achieve the action. Along with the this specifying information, there's a lot of what are called non-specifying information sources. So non-specifying information sources are information in the visual, in this case, we're talking about vision, but there's also in other senses, but there are information sources that are related to the task and can somehow give you clues of what's going on, but you need to do more work to, to get it. Um, and a strong example of that, let me start with situational probabilities. So in baseball, right, for those that don't know, you know, baseball, there's obviously balls and strikes. You know, three, four strikes, four, three strikes, you're out, four, four balls, you get a walk and go to first base. So almost universally, 
when a pitcher gets behind 3-0, that means if they throw one more ball, the batter gets to go to first base, a pitcher will throw a fastball because it's easier to control. So knowing that a count is 3-0, a batter almost always can guess that the pitch is going to be a fastball, right? This is non-specifying information though, right? Knowing that a pitch is a fastball does not ex tell you exactly what time it will arrive or where it will be. You can use that information and elaborate on it from some model and some other things to do that, but on its own, it doesn't do that, okay? So that's the difference. The other ones are shown here. This is the angle the ball's coming out of the pitcher's hand. One of the things baseball batters are trained to look for is what's called the hump in the curveball, right? So a curveball, which is a slower pitch, is launched at a higher angle. So it comes out like this. So this is a launch angle. Again, that is a non-specifying information source because it doesn't tell you exactly where the ball is going. You need to do more work to figure that out. The other one is the angular size on its own. This is particularly relevant if you're hitting off a pitching machine that's throwing the ball at the same speed every time, and you can just start your swing when it reaches a certain angular size. So there's all these non-specifying information sources and specifying information sources. Okay, so that's what information the batter has. What are they controlling, okay? Um, there's been a bunch of work uh, by me and other people looking at a baseball swing. And a baseball swing, and this is the work, some of the work I'm gonna describe, we use force plates and, and motion tracking it to identify these things. But basically you can see in that image, baseball swings have roughly a very similar structure to them. There's some different individual differences, but baseball swing usually starts with the front foot coming off the ground, the stepping phase. What a batter is doing there is they're taking the weight off the ground and shifting all their weight to the back leg. They're coiling up, okay? They're storing force that they're gonna unleash onto the ball by putting their foot back down, the landing phase. So what they're establishing here is a kinetic chain by taking a force in the back leg up the body, through the hips, through the core, through the shoulders, through the arms, to the back, okay? So they're doing a kinetic link, so then the bat is gonna move and then there's going to be impact. Right, so you get these, you can identify these phases by uh, the force, okay? The changes in force when you take your foot off the ground and when you put it back down and so on, right? So one key point here, right? Well, one is that, you know, it's a very complex full body movement. The second is there's a lot more to it than the, just the bat movement, right? Shifting the weight forward and back is, is as important as the actual bat movement for generating a powerful swing. Okay? So that's one thing to know. So knowing that, what do we do now? No, how we know we have this information, specifying and non-specifying. We have the control, what we need to control. How do we put these two things together into control models? In that paper, what I've done, what I did was to look at a bunch of different studies and data and try to come up with different ways that a swing could be controlled using these two different approaches: information processing approach and ecological approach. And I, so let's look at those. I've kind of diagrammed this out. Um, and I've actually come up with two different versions of the information processing model, right? So here's an information processing predictive model-based control in baseball batting, right? So we have these phases of the swing. We have the ball release. The important point is to start with is the batter's going to use its indirect perception, right? They're using clues that don't tell them exactly what they need to know. Right? They're going to use situational probability. I know what the count is, so I can guess it's a fastball. They're going to use advanced cues from the pitcher's delivery. The pitcher's holding their glove a little bit tight. That might be a fastball. Right? Their arm's moving slower. It's a changeup. Then they're going to use the non-specifying information sources from the ball flight, the hump and the curveball and, and things like that. They're going to take all of those and put it into a 3D world model. So basically a physics model that uses these information sources to predict the trajectory. So we're gonna predict, because I'm using indirect perception, I have to predict where the ball is gonna be. So I'm gonna predict where the time to contact and where it's gonna cross the plate, okay? Then I'm going to program the action into a, a motor program, okay? And generate a ballistic open loop swing. And what I've done in this model is I've allowed for kind of two stages of this. One early in the thing to initiate the stepping and one later in the to actually initiate the swing. And also I've given an opportunity here where if the parameters, the prediction is way off, <laughs> the ball's gonna be way off the plate, you can actually stop 
like, and this is called checking your swing in baseball. And I've studied that before. So this is one possible variant of it where you actually have a model in your head, a computational model that calculates like a uh, trajectory, <laughs> you know, physics, does basic physics calculations. The other model I, I look, I've come up with was one that actually um, uses stored memories. So trajectories. So for maybe for a particular pitcher, you remember their fastball does this, it goes there, right? And so what you do is a pitch recognition stage where you recognize it's a fastball versus a curveball. Then you can access kind of a lookup table of stored trajectories that allow you to make a prediction and generate a movement, right? So again, the key thing here though, is that we're starting with impoverished information. We need to have all these clues because it's not useful, you know, we don't know. Then we're going to predict, use some sort of internal representation or model to predict, then generate a, and then program an open movement. Okay, so that's kind of the one approach. Why might we believe that this is what, how it happens? What evidence is there for this? While looking at it, there's a, there's, this is for a long time believed to be how it's done, right? There's really not been considered another way to do it, largely because of the times involved, right? A baseball swing is so fast and so quick, the, um, it doesn't seem like there would be much time for online control. Like online control, right, requires me to pick up information and use it to adjust my movement continuously on the fly. If it's so fast, right, the, due to the perceptual motor delays, would I actually be able to, to adjust on the fly? It doesn't seem like it. The other thing that, second thing that kind of supports this model-based control is it's there's a long been known, and, and this has been challenged recently, that, you know, it started with the work of Terry Bayhill, um, showing that batters can't actually keep their eye on the ball all the way to the plate. They lose it quite a distance, sometimes 10 feet from the plate. It's off the fovea. So the information, the specifying information I talked about in the, the slide there, maybe can't be used because the ball's not being seen clearly anymore. Okay? Another thing that really a lot of people use as evidence for this model-based predictive control are research studies from anticipation which I, I'm guessing you, you've talked about in, in, in your, your class. Anticipation studies where you show people a video of an unfolding event, like a baseball pitch or a tennis serve. You stop it at some point and then ask them to usually make a verbal judgment. In baseball, you have to say, was that a ball or a strike? What type of pitch it was? And in general, we find more highly skilled tennis players or baseball players are better at doing that than lesser skilled athletes, suggesting that's what they're doing when they actually hit. They're making this prediction about what's going on. The other effect is that hit, hitting performance seems to depend a lot on the situational probabilities, sequencing. Um, you know, if I throw you three fa two fastballs in a row and then a different pitch, it kind of you'd perform worse. You know, that's some of the work that I did. There's also this really interesting effect people looked at recently called tunneling. Okay. In tunneling, uh, and there's a video you can see there. In tunneling, what a pitcher tries to do is throw two different pitches, say a fastball and a curveball, so that they travel the first part of their trajectory travels down the same tunnel. Okay, they stay in this tight thing. Then after that, they go to very different locations. And the idea is, if the batter is using kind of uh, prediction or memory, they they might think that this pitch is this one right? And so they'll be way off, right? If you think it's going to be the fastball that's up here, and it's actually the curveball that's down there. Um, you're, so you're taking away the information, the, the information before they have to start their swing. Right? So that, that's the general idea. So that effect seems to support kind of this memory, you know, this kind of prediction model. The other version that um, I want to talk about, the alternative version is this perspective online control. And the idea here is that we're starting with specifying information. We're starting with information that is good enough. I don't need to enhance it in anymore. And what I've talked about here is we have direct perception. So we're picking up information. Um, in this case, you're picking up information starting. You're picking up information about the time until the pitcher is going to let go of the ball. Then you're picking up, once the ball is released, information about the actual ball flight, the time to contact, the OP I showed in there. You're using that not to program or predict, you're using that to couple the movement of the bat and the body, which is this acceleration Y, to the actual uh, movement of the ball, 
information from the ball. So you, you're moving the uh, online, you're continuously adjusting your movement, closed loop control, um, which includes both your weight shifting and the actual bat movement in, in a way to, to adjust, right? To, to hit the ball by not programming uh, based on a prediction, by continuously adjusting based on currently available information to you. So that's the basic idea. What evidence is there for this online control? Well, th the first thing is to kind of note that the, the usual arguments against online control, that the thing is happening too fast, um, doesn't really hold water because even if you lose, there's a point in the action where you can no longer update, you, you no longer use feedback because things are happening so fast, as long as you're acting on this current future, which I talked about in perspective control, you're going to get there even if you stop losing information, right? If I'm adjusting my move, my bat movement to close the gap between my bat and the ball, as long as nothing else changes after I stop losing information, I'm going to get my bat there to the right time, right? So I can go, I don't have to have information right up to the last second. There's also research on eye movements, right? Showing that batters actually can keep their eye on the ball by using a combination of eye and head movements. Um, even if they did lose the ball off the fovea, we're not talking about acuity here. Um, that information I talked about, the time to contact and stuff is still very good, even if the ball is quite a far distance off the fovea. What about the, uh, the anticipation experiments? Well, I've been you know, growingly uh, believe that these are, not to dismiss them, but I think they're kind of artifacts, right? What we're doing is in a lab, we're creating a task that's almost nothing like the real task. Saying fastball is nothing like swinging a bat to hit a fastball, right? Um, so yes, bat skilled batters can do that better, because they are paying attention, picking up different, different information from the pitcher's delivery, advanced cues. But that, that doesn't mean that's what they're actually doing during the actual skill. They're actually using a prediction. Okay, So that's kind of what I've come to kind of think about that. There's also a lot of evidence. The best evidence for online control comes when you look at the variability in the swing. And this is some of the recent work that I've done in this area. So what I want to talk about is a cup some results from a couple of studies I've done um, recently, uh, both of them published in Frontiers in Psychology. The first one was this transfer of training study. And this was a study that I'm really, really proud of because it took me 10 years to do it. Because what I did was to train a bunch of people in real and virtual conditions, uh, followed them to their next season of play, then followed them for five more years to see if they made it to professional or college and so on. The bottom line of this, and I'm not going to go into detail, is that what I found was that you can get transfer from a virtual environment. In particular, the two things that led to the transfer were in my uh, setup was I had a virtual environment that, first of all, at, allowed me to add way more variability to practice than batters normally get. So they had way more variability in pitch speeds, pitch locations, and pitch types, right? In typical batting practice, you hit off the same speed on a pitching machine, or you have a coach that's kind of throwing the same speed all the time. So I had, the in the virtual environment, I could change these things. The second thing that was important was the way I changed it. I could change these things to keep you kind of right at your ch optimal challenge point. right? So if you're hitting really well, I could make the ball at pitch speed faster until you started to hit perform worse, then I make it slower. Same with the range of pitch speeds. right? So that I did find strong evidence in terms of both in the lab, uh, league statistics, and the level of play they release, reached. And as I said, it was mostly due to this variability, and I think that's going to be important. The second study is one that I did published last year where I looked at the force plate data from this training study and looked at what changed um, from pre to post training in, in these groups. And what I found was some interesting things. The first thing I found is what happens when you look, remember we have those distinct phases in the swing, lifting the lead foot off, bringing it back down, shifting the weight forward, swinging the actual bat. What I did first was to look at the variability. So I basically just calculated the standard deviations of all those swings across trials. So if I did multiple swings, and what you see is you get this pattern that we refer to in perspective control, we could see the funnel of variability. So standard deviation at the early stage of the swing, 
the landing phase is quite high, 50 milliseconds. The standard deviation near the end, when the bat's actually in the hitting zone, is very low. And it's approaching that plus or minus nine millisecond, right, that we needed. Um, the speeds in my study were a bit lower than Major League Baseball, so this is actually what you need to kind of hit effectively. This pattern, so think about this, my variability is decreasing during the movement. So it's decreasing after I've already started it, right? There's no way that this can possibly occur other than with online control, right? What's happening here is I'm adjusting some aspect of my, the later parts of my swing based on what happens earlier, right? To make it more accurate. And what you can see actually this, this effect, this funnel gets stronger after the training, right? So this is exactly what we, we find and we expect in perspective control. You're adjusting your movement. The other interesting thing I'll point out, and this is a really important point for motor control. If you believe that movements are controlled prospectively like this, then the start of movements aren't really that important, right? You need to just get in the bright ballpark, pun intended, but you can have really high sloppy variability. And this is what, for example, Dave Lee also found in his famous long jump, running up to a long jumping board study. That's important because think about how much we obsess about the start of movements, motor control research, all the research we do on reaction time. Reaction time, if you believe perspective control is really not that important. It's really not important what you do right away. It's how you how you go along, what happens after you start moving. That's critical. So that's one thing I found. The other thing I did was to use um, a kind of an analogy of what's called an uncontrolled manifold analysis. So. What I'm showing here is splitting the swing into two parts, basically shifting the weight back and shifting it forward again. And what we can do with this, if I have us pick a particular pitch speed, 85 miles an hour, it imposes this time constraint on my movement that my backwards weight shift and my forwards weight shift have to add up to this value, 479. And that's what's shown with this black line. This black line is any combination of forward and backward weight shifts that add up to this, meet this criteria. The red is shown within the margin for error, okay? In the uncontrolled manifold concept, we call this good variability because it potentially allows you to adjust and adapt while still meeting the goal, the time constraint. Movement this way, okay, if I start at this point and then I go in this direction, that's bad variability, right? In this case, the forward weight shift and the backward weight shift are too slow. By the time I get my bat there, I'm going to be way late. This one, they're too fast, right? They're, I'm getting the bat there too early. So this, any movement in this direction is bad. Any movement in that direction is good. And what I found in my study is the black dots are showing uh, for pretest. Okay, This is for uh, one participant. Um, the white dots are showing post-test. Okay. What you can see is pre-test, they had kind of a roughly equal amount of variability in both directions. After training, they had almost all good variability, right? So a couple of key important things. First of all, they're not just repeating the same swing, right? These are all swings, individual swings with timings all ranging all over the place. So they're not repeating the same swing. What they're doing is what we call a motor synergy. They're allowing these two phases to compensate for each other. So uh, if I do um, a backwards weight shift that's a bit too long, I make the forward weight shift a bit quicker, right? They're functionally compensating for each other. Again, the only way that that could happen is through online control, right? If you're pre-programming something, you can't adjust for it online like that. So that's uh, kind of what I found. Also found, this is some data. This is um, improvements in batting uh, on base percentage during league play. This is the amount that their good variability changed, and I found this relationship. These are all training groups. So some groups showed no effect, but if we put them, these are the kind of group that had the high variability in the training, right? So it seems to be strong effects, okay? So online control, There's the, the first thing is a baseball swing is more than the bat movement. And it seems like particularly the early parts, this weight shift to forward and back are definitely evidence of online control. You're adjusting, uh, using information to compensate and have a dysfunctional variability. Also critically, 
a baseball swing is a successful baseball swing does not involve repeating the same action over and over like you would expect if you pre-program something. It it's not involved a, a repeatable swing, right? Instead, it involves what Bernstein famously called repetition without repetition, right? You're repeating the outcome of getting the barrel to the ball, but not by repeating the movement. You're actually doing a slightly different movement all the time because you're allow you're compensating, you're allowing for this functional variability and this online control. And this um, consistent with my training results, if we if we work on enhancing this in practice, making more adaptable by having more variable conditions, it actually makes you better at this, right? So the, again, there seems to be um, pretty good evidence. What about some of the other factors, right? So if we want to believe this online control, okay, in the movement, yeah, that makes sense. But what about these off, what you call these offline factors? Like, how can you explain the explain the effect of count, a uh, pitch count? like the three balls and no strike effect I talked about earlier, if I'm just using information currently available, why would that ever affect? Well, the way that I've been thinking about this now, and some of these are things I'm writing about right now and still thinking about, is instead of this involving prediction, I like to think about this as education of attention. attention. So when I'm pretending on the count of the situation, I change my intention, right? So if I'm ahead in the count in baseball, I might try to pull the ball hit it to, to the same side of the field I'm standing because that's the best chance for a home run. Or if I'm behind in the count, my intention might be to just put the ball in play. And this is some work I did several years ago that's showing when I ask batters to do these different tasks, so either pull the ball, hit it to the opposite field, or do whatever they want, they actually pick up different information, right? The, this was, I actually, actually asked them to judge the size of the ball. Um, and balls on the inside when you're trying to pull look bigger and it actually made them swing more. So I think what's going on here is instead of using a account to predict, you're using an account to change your intention, right? That's why account has it. the count has the impact. What about um, pitch sequencing and calibration, right? Um, so pitch sequencing, instead of being an effective prediction, again, what I think of it is and what I'm modeling it now is effective calibration. So when you establish it in this information control law to control your movement, right? Of course, you need to calibrate it based on your own capabilities and based on the dynamics of the system. And the best example I like to use is when you rent a car, right? When you rent a car and it has very different brakes, so maybe the brakes are much tighter. At first, you stop really hard and it's really annoying. You have to adjust the calibration, right? You're using the same control law to, to break the car, but the calibration of how hard you push. What I, what I think is going on in baseball is like, if I throw you uh, several fast pitches, right, I'm going to change my calibration because the movement required to, to, to get moving and to keep up the speed when the pitch is fast is going to be higher, right? So I'm going to change my calibration based on the sequencing, right? So that's the kind of way that I'm, I'm thinking about it. So in my view, I, you know, there's still some work to be done, but Overall, I think that perspective control, online control, just gives a better account. I think it, it, it can explain these variability effects, can explain what's happening in the whole swing. And for me, it's more parsimonious, right? One of the things in the ecological approach we try to do is not resort to some internal model. The internal model complicates things, right? It's essentially moving the problem from one place to the other, right? Who's looking at the internal model? The, if I predict that a pitch is a fastball, what do I do next? How do I actually generate a swing with that? Perspective control actually gives you specific predictions about how a person is going to move that you can test where the online, the predictive control model is less able to do that. So for me, I think it just gives a better account. Yes, there's some things that we still need to address with it, but I think it just gives a, a simpler, more straightforward account. Okay, that's it for what I wanted to talk about. Um, if you're inter interested in more information about uh, me, you can find it here. Thank you.